Sometimes I wonder if we understand Islam as it should be understood. Sometimes it's hard to strengthen our faith amidst all these distractions. Sometimes we're confused about what we want and what our next steps should be. Sometimes we need to take a moment and reflect on what matters most. And because we live in such uncertain times with so much going on around us, I guess sometimes we just gotta sit down and talk about it. So, as youth living in the West, sometimes we're distracted by everything that's going on in our daily lives. And sometimes we don't ever stop to think about, you know, the circumstances that brought our parents to Canada or to any Western country and why we're here. I mean, I think that speaks a lot to, um, you know, the demands that we have as Ahmadi Muslims living in other countries. I mean, like in Pakistan, for example, we're not allowed to claim ourselves to be Muslim and we can't do tabligh and we can't preach. And, you know, I mean, like tabligh, for example, is one of the foremost responsibilities of any Ahmadi Muslim. And sometimes living in the West, we're so distracted by everything that's going on that we don't even give it a second thought. So we see that a lot of youth are dormant when it comes to doing tabligh and you know, speaking to people about Jamaat Ahmadiyya, about who Hazrat Naseem Maudalai was and who the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, was. So when we speak about tabligh and doing tabligh, what does this actually mean? Um, I mean, we all know that tabligh means to convey the message. And I think that um, if, if we were to focus on this aspect more instead of maybe the results, uh, that what will happen, I think that is something that uh, is, is missing because we have the ultimate message. We have the framework that, inshallah, humanity is coming towards. Uh, it's what resonates with uh, you know, human nature. And uh, we're seeing it more and more in, in pop culture, even that people are converging more towards Islamic ideals. CEOs, we're seeing all the time articles, they're waking up at 5 a.m., they're meditating. We already knew about that you know, 1,400 years ago. Um, LeBron James recently, uh, he was asked, why is he playing at such a high level still? He said, I stopped eating pork, yeah. right? So people know, it, one way or another, they're coming towards the Islamic uh, teachings because that is the ultimate. I think we just have to convey the message and inshallah we will see the results. So I mean, what does tabligh entail? When we say that khuda need to do, I mean, I mean, the Muslims need to do tabligh. What do they even say? I mean, like somebody who's saying, somebody who's sitting there in the masjid, you know, hearing, um, you know, uh, Murabi Saab say, you know, everybody should do tabligh, you know, it's our responsibility. Something's just going through his mind, like, what, what am I, like when I approach somebody, what am I even supposed to say? Like, I, I don't know them. Um, maybe I'm, maybe they're socially anxious, right? They suffer from social anxiety. They don't know how to talk to people. Maybe that's one of the reasons. But when we say tabligh, what does tabligh mean? Like, how do you just go up to somebody and just start talking about, oh, you know, we believe that a Messiah has come. So I think uh, from, at least from personal experience, I see it as a, I see it in two ways. The first way is, is if tabligh is pretty dominantly how you present yourself as an individual, as a person, as a, as a living uh, example of Islam, right? When you present yourself as a good individual, just as a good individual, people see that and they want to be like you because they see success in that. People like to see good people and they want to be like them. It's attractive to them. Yeah. So I think that's the first part that I see that really tells me about what, how the bleak should be done. It's the first part about how you approach the individual right. rather than just saying things that, you know, uh, that may not reflect what you actually do and how you live your life. Yeah. The second part is you have to believe in what you're trying to tell people, right? So I've noticed that uh, if, if you look at businesses, if you look at uh, the rest of the world, you know, you find that marketing is done based on belief in your product. Yeah. You know, you want to show off your product. You want to tell people that, you know, this is my product and I want you to be like this. I want you to use my product. I want you to benefit from my product. So these are two really, really valuable things that I think people can use to help them become uh, or get to that level of, you know, doing appropriate tabligh, proper tabligh, right? Those are the high level ways that I think that tabligh, is, tabligh represents. And then on the ground level, there are different methods in which you can achieve tabligh. Like the main way that I think you can achieve tabligh is by knowing your material. So several athletes have been asked, you know, how do you avoid anxiety when you, when you go and perform? They say, it's because I practice so much. Right. When you practice, you're not thinking anymore. Right. What you're doing is you're, 
you're presenting something that you've rehearsed so much and it's so easy to you now that that anxiety and that pressure is gone. So that's how I think that youth can start to look at the bleak. And these are some of the in introductory things that they can do to start their path to the bleak, right? I think other way you would like to, I mean, you're, you're a convert to Islam and And I mean, you've, you've spoken to people about your beliefs as well. And you've sort of changed your beliefs over time as well. I mean, you first accepted uh, Sunni Islam before you came to Ahmadiyat. So, I mean, if somebody was to tell you to start doing tabligh, I mean, that's something you're passionate about as well. So what kind of tips would you give? Well, I would uh, really advise them to read the Holy Quran because this is the book that convinced me. It ultimately wasn't uh, how Islam was being represented on the news. That was not the deciding factor. But when I finished the Holy Quran, that last page, I was convinced that this couldn't possibly be from man. And you know what's funny is when there's a best-selling uh, book on the shelves, people are always saying, oh, read that, read that. When Da Vinci Code came out, they're saying, read it. I feel like if people sat down and read the Holy Quran, imagine how they would be pushing this thing. Like, this is that best-selling book. This is the best book to read. So it really was uh, the impact of that. And it should show in a person that they have also read it. Right, definitely. Anything else that, I mean, some, some sort of tips and techniques because, I mean, do, doing the bleed, I mean, like you said, you know, just going out and practicing. Um, I mean, that's, that's a brilliant way. I mean, not even looking for an end result, but just first telling yourself that, you know, I need practice and just putting yourself out there and seeing what happens. You know, maybe, maybe you might be a gem of somebody who does the bleed, right? And, and you don't know. You can come up with arguments on the spot. But I guess it's just a matter of putting yourself out there and starting. I think uh, it's exactly uh, as you guys have been saying. It's all about practice. And when you go out there and you start, you, you figure out how to talk to people. Trial by fire, as they say. Um, I think the biggest thing is the motivation. Mm -hmm. If you have the motivation to do tabligh, the rest will come. Mm -hmm. And I think that that thing is what we have to spread more. Basically, you know, as far as I see it, our entire purpose of coming to these countries in the West, in Canada and America and Europe, is to give the message of the Prophet Islam. That's our destiny. Right. In 1400 years of Islam, we are those in this uh, state or this uh, segment of Islam's history who've been brought to these lands. And if we realize that this is why we're here, it's not to uh, compete with each other in, in buying bigger homes or bigger cars. These things, Azam Asim Islam said, look, the whole world is in every field right. except for in the field of God. So you should advance in the field of God. That means developing relationship with God and then giving that to the people. Mm -hmm. I think inshallah. You know what's interesting is um, I was speaking to a convert once and um, you know, he, was, he was saying that when somebody wakes up in the morning, they don't go looking for a Messiah, right? So I mean, this is something that's very important for us. I mean, this is somebody who already accepted Jamaat Amdiya and he's saying that, you know, you guys are speaking about the Messiah. Maybe our approach would be different. Right? That's why we'd have to do research into that as well. That, like you were saying, that you know, speaking to people on their level as well, something that would be convincing or appealing to them. Like Hazim Musim al Islam is the Messiah of peace. Maybe that would be something that would appeal to somebody. He's the Messiah who, who came to give comfort. Right? He's the Messiah who came to unite. Right? Um, a lot of these things that we would have to look into from our own perspective, according to how we've been brought up in the Western society that what are things that would appeal to other people? I mean, everybody's looking for something. People are looking for happiness. People are, are looking for contentment that they're not finding anywhere. But we know that Hazim, accepting Hazim Masih Maud Islam and Jamaat Ahmadiyya and Khilafat Ahmadiyya, that's something that will give us this thing. So when we go speaking and uh, preaching to people about who Hazim Masih Maud Islam is, these are things that we need to keep in mind. Not only the theological issues that surround his coming, that may just fly over somebody else's head. But, and I guess one thing for that would be, for example, if we're talking about tips and techniques is, you know, if we're speaking to our social circles about Hazim Masim Islam before we go to strangers, you know, some people might find it easier to talk to a stranger about it rather than people they've known for a long time. You know, maybe they might be judged differently and that might be an issue for them. But, you know, just as we said before, just putting yourself out there and speaking to somebody about who Hazim Masim Islam was and what Jamaat Ahmadiyya is and what it has to offer, right? You know, believe it or not, people are genuinely interested in what we do. 
right? right? Uh, for example, all of us, you know, we do something and we've been in school, we've, we've been at work outside of, you know, people from Jamaat Ahmadiyya. We've been at work around different people from different places around the world, people of different faiths. And they're always, you know, they would, they're curious as to what does this person do right. five times a day? Right. Why does this person, why is this person not here on Fridays at a specific time? Right. And they want to know why this benefits you. This is the, this is one of the prime times, you know, this is the, this is the, this is the moment when you have the time and the, and, the t and the position to explain to them, you know, what you're doing and how it benefits you. Because people don't do things that are detrimental to them, right? Unless, right. you know, we have examples of things that are beneficial in the short term, but in the long term, they're bad for you. But this, it helps you in every way possible. And we have to explain to these people, to explain to people, you know, what this is doing for us, right? And a part of that is going out there and sharing that story. You know, what does prayer give to you, right? And how it, how it has benefited you. Personal examples of, of prayers that have come true for you. And people are interested in these things because people are looking for an answer. And everyone is struggling with something, you know. Everyone has questions or problems in their lives, right? And, you know, even with the rising levels of depression or discoveries of depression and other mental illnesses throughout the world, we have solutions that... You know, we have these solutions that we have had for a long time right. and that have helped us for a long, long time through this, right. through these methods that we adopt every single day, five right. times a day, right. specifically well, even I mean, with fasting. Like in, in previous episodes of this program, we were also speaking about how when you actually study the religion of Islam, you would be so proud of it because it has so much to offer the world, right? right? I mean, what are some of the, what are some of the reasons that somebody would be shy in doing tabligh or not able to do so. I mean, in our experience with people that we've spoken to, what are some of the reasons that people don't do tabligh more often? I think it, as we discussed, the lack of knowledge. They think that they have to be a scholar in order to spread the message. I also think, and I had this feeling before, I don't want to be wrong. I don't want to say something about my faith and then go back and tell somebody and they say, no, that's not right. <laughs> So I'm afraid to make mistakes in this, and uh, that's fair. You know, we feel that shows how much we value our religion, that we're afraid to make a mistake in conveying the message. So I think that we should take that chance, though, and start off with what we know. You know, they need to just, they've heard something. Start off with that. And they themselves, over time, will learn more and more. And if they want to go to the advanced questions, uh, like suffering or heaven and hell, they can go there. But they should start with the simple stuff, you know, nobody's asking to jump right in and have some theological debate. Just yeah, yeah. enter something like, you know, that cleanliness is very important to us. That when you shake a Muslim's hand, you can know his hand is clean because it's so important to a Muslim. So this start yeah. up with the little stuff. Yeah. You know, I mean, like, I've, I've, I've studied at Jamia Hamdi Canada, and we used to memorize a lot of references. But I noticed that when I used to speak to people about Islam, we wouldn't necessarily have to use references. You know, so I mean, it's not really knowing any anything about, you know, references and, you know, what a certain person said. But Islam is so logical that you can pick a point that appeals to you and has convinced you. And you can use that as your basis point of doing tabligh to somebody else, right? You know, this is one hadith in the Holy Prophet Sallallahu said that if you want to cre uh, create affinity between you and another person, ask them about their forefathers yeah. or their heritage. Yeah. And... Um, you know, I've, I've done this myself and I've seen others do this too, that uh, if you meet someone, you know, of a different ethnicity, you can speak to them about where they're from and where you're from. And, right. and then you can sort of, uh, you know, and if they're from an Islamic background, right, maybe from Persia or from another Islamic country, that is all of a sudden becomes a tying point to talk to each other about faith. And then if you're talking to a Muslim, um, then most Muslims know of or expecting a Mahdi to come or that there will be someone, Isa yeah. will come again, as we know, right. right? This is the great awaited question amongst all the Muslims. Mm -hmm. So if you can strike up that conversation and say that, well, actually, the people of my community, and we believe that he has come and our founder was that person, that's usually a, a good starting point sometimes. Some of the things mm -hmm. that uh, I have used with, uh, with youth and in my personal life as well is that uh, the first thing is that you have to understand that people want to talk about themselves, right? Just like we want to talk about ourselves, people want to tell them people want to tell you about their story okay. so the first thing you can do to start a conversation is basically ask someone 
what do you do? Be a good uh, listener. Yeah. Be a good listener, yeah. right? Once you're a good listener, the person will want to listen to you back. Yeah. So that's one tip that I used and it's been very, very successful for me and I've yeah. made many friends because of this. Yeah. The second thing is go in pairs, right? Go with someone who has experience and ask people. And, and like Ahmed Bai said, the motivation is what's going to carry you to that level. And if you're motivated and you ask someone that, you know, is experienced in Tablik that you want to go with them, they're not going to deny you. Going with the person and seeing that, uh, seeing that, seeing everything unravel in, a, in unravel in a conversation, is what gives you that confidence, right? Because you've been there. First conversation is gonna be, you know, you're gonna be watching primarily, and I say I tell the younger Khudam, younger youth to jump in a little bit. You know, don't take more than three or four people because it looks a little bit uh, difficult for the individual that's being talk, that's being that you're having the discussion with. But going pairs and then slowly, second and third conversation you should take the lead yeah. and then after that this person the individual that you're training is going to be able to break the ice as they say right, yeah. right? and uh be better and better and better at it as they grow older right yeah. so i think i think one of the beautiful things about the league is that it gets you out of your comfort zone yeah. and 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 i think as a person sometimes you need that to develop even personally yeah. right like um when we used to do uh the league um with our with our drama friends you know, there, there used to be certain uh, Jamaat events at which they would uh, call for Jamaat students to come and, you know, help give flyers and call people. And, you know, some of our friends were really outspoken and some of them, and some of us were really timid, right? So we would sort of learn from them. Like if there was a couple walking by, um, you know, we'd say, you know, it's a beautiful day. You know, this is a beautiful message. Here you go, take this flyer, right? And, and, we, and we would just come up with all these, all these random things that we didn't think were in us, but we were trying to just, you know, get out of our comfort zone because we sort of realized that, you know, okay, we're standing here, we have flyers in our hand, there's like thousands of people walking by and nobody's taking one, right? So what do we need to do? And we sort of had to force ourselves out of our comfort zone. And then we started noticing that, you know, people would not only take the flyer, but they would read it, they would stop and they would start asking us, what is this? You know, we, we would have a video of Hazuda and Rumi Allah be his helper, um, you know, like, like in Nazam, I was playing in the background and then people would see Hazud and they would stop and ask him, ask us who this, who this person was and we would have the opportunity. But I think it's more of, um, you know, getting out of that comfort zone and doing something that you have never done before. Like a lot of people may be suffering from social anxiety. A lot of people, it's not even that the bleak is their problem or, or not doing the bleak is their problem. It's that they're not able to speak to people in general, right? Like other than their close knit circle of friends. So, what we're trying to encourage them is, you know, it's that when you go with a group of guys and you sort of start doing flyers like this, it's, it's actually fun and you get to talk to people and you get to learn. When one of my friends was actually telling me, I was asking him for tips regarding Tablig. Um, and he was saying that, you know, most like 99% of the people you will speak to, they're very nice and they're very kind, right? Sometimes we have this thing in our mind that, you know, if we sort of say that, you know, we are Ahmadi Muslims, uh, Muslims who believe in a Messiah who was born in India, um, at this date, or however we introduce Jamaat Ahmadiyya ourselves, you know, people might look at us weird, or they might say something bad to us or something, but most of the people we speak to, they're very nice and kind, and they'll be very welcoming, right? So sometimes we have a perception of people that's not true as well, just like how we think that other people would have a perception of us, which is not true at all, right? So it goes both ways, I guess. I was just thinking that there are some Muslims who they themselves buy into what the media says Islam right. is. So they think when I knock on the store, he also is going to believe that and he's going to believe that. Like they think everybody around them has this negative idea of Islam. But if you go and ask them, what do you think about Islam? You'd be surprised yeah. that, you know, my stepdad, for instance, he would tell his coworkers that, you know, what you see on the news, this is not the Muslims. This is this is the true Islam. Yeah. And I would ask him, like, where do you get that from? And yeah. he's like, we do it with everything else. We exaggerate. But they should know that this, the media is exaggerating the Muslim population. Yeah. And he made me think that, you know, if there was a genuine reason that, or if there was an actual thing that Islam was doing this, it's one in five people on the planet, a terrorist. If we really believed that, we would be more scared than we are. So I confronted a coworker and I thought, if you really think Islam is a threat, you know, you'd really it sense the gravity when one in five people are. <laughs> So you'd be surprised that when you ask the average person, they I think, say no. I think only someone like Adam could make that type of argument. Like if <laughs> yeah. I was to go and start telling people that, you know, it wouldn't, it wouldn't yeah. fare well with me, right? Oh, it definitely. Uh, I get to go into places with conversations that uh, other people wouldn't be able to go. But so many of my coworkers have uh, opened up to me and say that, you know, I know that Muslims aren't. But they themselves are shy to speak to us. 
Yeah. You know, a lot of my coworkers, once they found out I was Muslim, they just came at me with all these questions. And sometimes there was a list. They're like, I've always wanted to ask a Muslim this. Mm -hmm. So we should uh, think that, you know, people around us in my work, they're probably waiting to ask me, but they're mm -hmm. shy themselves. Right. So if we at least just create a, an aura that, you know, I'm welcome. And even if you just mention sometimes that, hey, if you ever have a question about Islam, you know, you can ask me. And if I don't know the answer, yeah. I can find somebody who does. I think at the same time, there's a lot of Jamaat events, for example, just Hassan in Canada, where we invite people to come and see what Ahmadiyyat is all about. So, I mean, if somebody wants to do tablik, this would be the first step, and they don't even have to do much. You're inviting somebody to an event, you know, there's free food for them, you know, they can come and see exhibitions, they can come and see your community, they can come and see what happens, what's going on, and that could be the icebreaker. And then from there, they can start to speak to somebody else, right? I think this point you mentioned about bringing people into the setting of Jamaat, this is very important. What I've seen in the last few years is that those Khudam who bring their friends around Jamaat, whether it's even a local khudam event, um, a youth night, khudam night, bring them to the masjid after namaz, go for dinner, then bring them to a shah namaz. That is a very powerful way of engaging your friends uh, in tabligh, mm. but also showing them what jamaat is, not just telling them about it. Yeah. And when they see, you know, by the grace of Allah Ta'ala, this atmosphere of jamaat is a blessed atmosphere. Mm. They see humble people, they see people who are righteous, uh, devoted to God. Um, when they see this, this has an impact on them. So I think if we increase this trend in our khudam, the, the tide of the belief will increase naturally, inshallah. You know, actually, he just made me think of something because we're both from the same Jamaat. There was one uh, new convert in Hamilton that uh, one of the khudam, he was really interested in basketball. So they were friends in school, they played basketball, and he would always invite them to the gym that we would have on the weekends. So they would play basketball together, and then he says, you know, we also compete in ABL and we have ishtama. And I remember seeing him one day at the National Ishtama and I thought, I thought this is for members only. <laughs> and they're like, he converted, like he came in through the sports, but he stayed for the religion. We have more to offer than, you know, a theological debate. We're everything, you know, yeah. sports, food, you know, some people who are like the food. I love the Pakistani food. <laughs> I mean, they there's, come. There's, there's, there are a lot of people who are impressed when they come to Peace Village. I mean, I've been living in Peace Village for about 19, 20 years now. And I mean, we grew up in this, but when people come and they see the streets named after certain people and then you explain to them, you know, there's Amdi Avenue, Mosque Gate, and they say, wait, so a lot of Amdis live here? Like, there's, it's just Amdis? You tell them, like, yeah, like more than 90% of the population is just Amdis. And then they'll come and they'll see Avan at Tahir. And, you know, some, some people will come to the MTS studio as well and see it's the newest addition to Avan at Tahir. And they'll see the masjid and they'll be like, this is amazing. We never knew you guys were here. And they'll be like our neighbors who live, you know, like just, just two minutes down the street. Right. But people are really impressed and they're impressed by things that we don't think they would be impressed by. Right. So I think we just need to evaluate um, all of the things that would appeal to somebody and then use those as avenues by which we can, you know, introduce Jamaat Ahmadiyya to them. One thing I just I remembered uh, was that and this is something that you struggle with as well, is that when and a flaring is one of the one of the means that we use and we have been using for a long time to deliver our message as do other organizations right flyering is some way that right. you can present a picture right. when people don't take the flyer this is a mental thing you feel discouraged right. this is this happens you know it feels like rejection right. this is something that i encourage youth to fight path right. fight past right. the more and more you get rejected the less and less impactful it gets right, right? and don't think of it like it's a it's, it's a wall in front of you and that person hates you. That's not the case. The person doesn't dislike you. The person is simply not interested at the time. And we need to look at it from a positive perspective is that if person A rejects me, then eventually person Z, Z is gonna, ha they're gonna take the flyer. As you mentioned, you know, I can get away with some things that most people can't. Uh, I one time had our flyer and it had the big terrorism with the cross through it. Right. And I was going door to door saying, uh, I'm going door to door in your community fighting terrorism. And they're like, oh, I'm very glad to see. So they thought for a split second that I was Christian until I handed them the flyer. They're like, oh, you're Muslim? Okay. I said, yeah. And I'm going door to door fighting right. terrorism because uh, this yeah. is not right. This is yeah. So, yeah, you're right. Actually, I can see like maybe somebody with a bigger beard and maybe a yeah. turban and long dress going door to door saying fighting terrorism. There might be a miscommunication. Yeah. Yeah. So but it was just something I wanted to play with that. Yeah. I wanted them to let them know that like I'm on your side yeah. about the stuff we see on TV. Yeah. You might be a Christian or a Hindu and I'm a Muslim, but we're both in agreement. 
there should be no terrorism. And I mean, at the same time, if we think about it from this perspective, that doing the league, putting ourselves out there, it will not only bless our time, but it'll it'll give us those speaking skills, right? Right, that we can use in other parts of our life. And God Almighty will bless whatever we do later on because we're sacrificing our time to do the league. And I mean, uh, this is the work of the prophets, right? Like Hazrat Mizat Ahmad Ramulale used to say that how did Islam spread to different countries of the world? It wasn't through specific missionaries. It was through the merchants who used to take the message of Islam and everybody was just infatuated, just doing tabligh left, right, center to everybody that they met. And this is how they would do tabligh. So, I mean, this is something that uh, we should take as a role model for us. And we should know that, you know, just because we're not missionaries, just because we may not have the knowledge, it doesn't mean that we can't do tabligh. Once we dip our toes into doing tabligh, it's extremely fun. And you won't ever want to stop. So I think that's what, you know, the message that we can share with the youth. Otherwise, um, we had some great points that were shared here today. Uh, Jazakallah for your time and for sharing your experiences with us. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. मुझे कुछ कहना है पर है ये शर्त के जाए मेरा पैर